Good morning, everybody. This is the portion of the show where we let the notifications go out. I have my little graphic up here. I need to get me some uh, background music and uh, to play during this, you know, a little bit of, oh, I don't know, maybe some uh, good rock and roll or something. I don't know. But I need to do something. I'll have to talk to my partner, Eloy Escajedo, over at uh, Rockin' Woodworks. Very good guitarist. Writes his own music and the whole thing. He's also my partner in crime on the uh, Trampled Underfoot podcast every Tuesday evening here on the YouTube channel. Just take a look for Trampled Underfoot podcast on YouTube. That's us. But... We'll let the notifications go out, then we wait for the 12 o'clock hour to come up. Then I click a little button and say, Hey y'all, happy Sunday. Hope everybody is doing well. Hope uh, you got some shop time in this morning. Hope that things are going your way. Thanks for uh, spending part of that Sunday with me here. I do appreciate it. I know that time is sometimes precious, so the fact that you're spending part of it with me still kind of freaks me out. So let's go ahead and do a little bit of a roll call here and see what's going on. Uh, we got Mr. Mike Mazalik, one heck of a wizard with this Vectric software. The guy is phenomenal. Welcome aboard, Michael. Thanks for checking in. Kurt Briegel there in Wisconsin, who appears to be confused about what time zone he's in. But that's cool. <laughs> Steve Nealon at Harneal Media, the man, the myth, the legend, the wizard who sponsors Mark Lindsay CNC, which is going through a little bit of customization right now. And um, I know the front page doesn't look any different. It's not going to look any different for a little bit. I got to get some stuff figured out. I'm just basically reorganizing. But Steve sponsors uh, MarkLindsayCNC.com. And if you need a website, web store, merch, things like that, he's your man. He can hook you up. Uh, let's see. Bill Stoffer's checking in. Black or with cream and sugar? Um, two creams, one sweet and low, please. Let's see, Lee Dale checking in from Georgia, Steve Thomas in Arkansas, Jeff in Arizona over there, JMJ Love Dance, finally some days under 100 degrees, we actually got rain yesterday, got about a, not, a little over an eighth of an inch, but it was rain. Um, Ayal Peleg checking in from Israel, David Pingle from Wisconsin as well. Michael Johnston over there in Scotland. Ooh, ooh, Steve Late checking in from the UK, recovering from some major surgery. Hope you are doing well. Hope everything is going your way and you're on the mend. Let's see, Lewis Denton checking in from North Carolina. Ice Cream 62 over there in Italy. We are doing very well, my friend. Thank you very much for asking. Let's see. Kevin L's down in South Africa. How goes it today, Kevin? And I notice you have a slightly different uh, avatar there. Does that mean that your machine is no longer stalled? No, maybe I'm just looking at very small avatars. Maybe you're still stalled. Well, time to get back at it, my friend. Uh, Dale Francis checking in from Utah. Mike Smith in Central Florida. Uh, let's see. My chat just jumped. Uh, Mike Urbani checking in. Richard Poulin saying hello. Uh, David Dietrich over there in Michigan. Ronald Ledger in Quebec. Let's see, Joshua Cummins in New Jersey, Motorsport, who doesn't say where they're from, but welcome aboard. Rob Sandstrom in Temecula, California, Bumps in Carlisle, UK. Wow. Uh, let's see, Chip Frappier 
from soggy central Florida. We could use some soggy right about now. That rain we had yesterday was the first rain we've had since June. Okay, let's see. Tony Cruz checking in. Jim Hester from Kentucky. Uh, John Sautier. Dwayne Ruthig, DK in Chula Vista, south of San Diego. Uh, Jeff in Connecticut. Woody Wan, how you doing today? RB Woodwork from up north of me on I-5. <laughs> Franz Garricky in South Africa. How are you doing today? Richard Canton in Michigan. Rocky Mountain National Park this week. Oh, life is hard, isn't it? Life is hard. Ray Jones in Dickinson, Texas. Sargon Tavor, I hope you got the email. I replied, my apologies. Uh, let's see, Motorsport is in Colorado. Uh, Steve Late, all going very well, just a matter of time now. Well, that's pretty vague, Steve. You might want to rethink how you stated that. But <laughs> uh, Troy Figgins from San Antonio, and Jeff says they've forgotten how to spell rain there. Yeah, I forgot that water fell out of the sky for free. I mean, it's been a while. So, uh, let's see. We've got some questions already, and I appreciate those questions. I'll get to them in just a couple of minutes. Um, I wanted to, um, I wanted to go back through and talk a little bit about the tabs that I put in. I made a couple of technical errors in the video, and by the time I discovered them, it was like yesterday morning, and I was closed captioning the video, and I'm like, oh no. I'll just have to clean it up during the live Q&A. Uh, so let me go ahead and bring up Aspire. And then I'll uh, switch over and do a screen share here. And we'll get into... Yeah, I'll go ahead with the 3D view. And the mistake was... Well, one of the mistakes was when I was talking about the profile cutout tool path here. Um, I said to use the material thickness as your cut depth. That is not strictly speaking true. The reason I said that was I wanted to be able to start up here and trim down any of these areas out around in here knowing full well that these areas down here were not way up at, at the material, but my paranoia in keeping this bit away from the tabs is what guided that. And that's the way I've been using 3D tabs, was just using my material thickness as the, uh, as the cut depth on the profile cutout when I'm using 3D tabs. Well, you don't necessarily have to do it that way. You can adjust the tool path to start a little bit lower as long as it doesn't cut into the top of that tab. You also don't have to go all the way down to three quarters of an inch to cut all the way through. Once it's through this skin of material here and has cut the edge of your model the way it's supposed to be cut you don't have to keep going any further now i went back and i changed this tool path to have a start depth of an eighth of an inch that kept that bit from coming along and skimming the top of this this uh tab these tabs here and i ran it down to three eighths of an inch and basically that got through this edge of the model right here, but it doesn't need to go all the way down to where it's cutting into the machine bed because you're basically cutting air above this and cutting air below this. But rather than take a chance on it coming along and swiping the top of one of these tabs, then... I'd rather do it that way. Well, with the resulting change in my start depth and my cut depth, 
I was able to change the tab thickness to uh, 5 8 of an inch. Basically, all I did was I took the thickness of my material and I subtracted my start depth from that. And that's how thick this tab is going to be. So the bit no longer lifts all the way out of the material and then comes over, then drops back down. It just lifts up above this tab. That was the main thing, is not to cut through the tabs. So that was my modification to that. Um, also, I really didn't have any need to go with quarter-inch thick tabs here. This was done mainly to show you how to do it. Now, without resetting and having to recut and bore you with watching this uh, go around in circles again, we'll go back over here to the 2D view. Something else I could have done, but I did it this way on purpose. I, I'm looking at the bottom here. Let's go back to the top. I laid out the top, then went to the bottom and laid it out again. That was to reinforce how that layout is done. And I only copied things to the other side when I got to these tabs here. Now, for a smoother workflow, you could lay out the entire top here, then select all of your models, all of the vectors, right-click and copy everything to the other side so you only do the layout once. The way I was taught to teach was teach it again to reinforce it. I am not a professional teacher, so I'm kind of winging this as I go along. <laughs> so that's why I did that. That's why I went ahead and I brought the model in on this side, put added my vector off to the side. Then I went over to the bottom and did the same thing, was to just reinforce that's how it's done. So, I hope that answers that question and kind of clears up that little bit of a misunderstanding as far as using the full depth of the material when it comes to a, setting the, uh, the height. So, uh, let's see. Ayal Peleg wants to know, are the three passes needed? Those three passes are based on the cut depth I have that bit, I have set for that bit uh, for each pass. I tend to run, I, I run more on the conservative side. I'm a home hobbyist, so I can take the time. I tend to run with a cut depth of about half of the bit's cutting diameter. In this case, it's a quarter inch bit, so that's an eighth of an inch per pass. And it's cutting three eighths of an inch deep. So that breaks down to three passes. Now, you can push your machine as hard and as fast as you want to, but I would practice that on scrap before I did it. So, um, I, I just feel more comfortable doing that, going with the uh, half of its uh, cutting diameter. And it also depends on your machine. Some machines are more rigid and more stiff than others, and they'll cut three-quarter inch material in one pass. So, uh, I'll ask also, is it not cutting air? Yes, a little bit, but it's more important. I mean, at, think about it this way. At 100 inches per minute, the time it spends cutting an eighth of an inch in air of air is a lot better than chasing a part down that got thrown out of your uh, piece because the tabs broke. So, you know, you now if you want to get in and fine tune that tool path to where you are just fractionally machining material away, by all means, go for it. This was a basic introduction. You can get back into it and uh, fine tune that G code as much as you'd like. I know there are some real wizards with G code that'll look at a G code file go in and make a whole bunch of different changes and streamline that G-code to do exactly what you want it to do when you want to do it. 
I am not one of those people. I know just enough G code to make me dangerous. That's why I don't talk about it a lot. <laughs> so, okay, we'll go back up here and we'll check on the questions here. I know there was another one about the tabs. Um, okay, it was I all again. Uh, where the tabs align towards the center of the object. Does it matter at all? And how could they be so aligned if desired? Now, when you say in the center of the object, are you talking about the double-sided project or the single-sided project? Because those 3D tabs... Okay, this was a point that I tried to get across. Um, let me go back over to Aspire here. Um, and do the uh, screen share thing. Okay, we'll go back over here to the 2D view. When you add these tabs here in the component tree you're adding these tabs to the top side and that's going to sit on the modeling plane now the modeling plane on a double-sided project if i zoom in here the modeling plane sits in the center of the material here okay so when i put this dome on the modeling plane it's going from the center of the material upwards. It's added on top of that modeling plane. The same with this tab. That, depending upon the properties over here, that is automatically placing the bottom of this dome and the bottom edge of these tabs in the center of the material. Now, when you get over here into the properties, let's pick a tab here, get into the properties, that's what all this is. You can adjust your shape height but the bottom is going to stay put. You can adjust the base, base height. That's going to add a little bit of material underneath this edge, but this edge is going to stay in the center. Okay? So you have this one on the bottom, in this case, and this one on the top with this modeling plane in the center of the material. And that's confirmed, let me close this, that's confirmed when we come over here into Material Setup and we see the slider, the model position in the material is in the center. No gap above the top of the model, no gap below the model. So they are, the minute you add these tabs, they are automatically centered as long as that modeling plane is centered. And you'll also see that there's my slider is grayed out because the model takes up the whole piece of material. I can't adjust it. So I hope that answers that. So let's come out of there and come back over to you all. So... Okay, um, you're saying both, towards the center of the coordinate system. Well, you're referring to the XY center, not the Z. Uh, yes, and again, that's why I do all of my layout work with my XY datum in the center, so I can position things based off of the center. Um... And you were asking about the directions that the long axis of the tabs was pointing downwards. You can place those tabs anywhere you want to place them. I was just showing that simply because on a, on a round project, I find putting them at 45 degrees, I have more material out towards the corners than I do along the sides or the top and bottom. So I can put screws in the corners and my tabs in the corners and that's the, I've got more meat there. Now you can orient those tabs in any way you want them. You can, uh, if you lay out the top first and get that all done, 
you can highlight or select that dome model and all the tabs and use either the zero key or the nine key to rotate that entire thing 45 degrees or put it in whatever direction you want to. I just find that there's more material in the corners when you're cutting a round part out of a square piece of stock. So that's which way I orient my tabs. You can put those tabs anywhere you want. You don't have to use four. You can use three. You can use eight. You can use two. It just depends on your setup and what you want to do. This was, and that's why I was talking about the size of this project wasn't important. It's more about the process than it is about the specifics of the model, the size, the height, or anything like that. It was just to show you how to use those 3D tabs because that mystified me. They, they were added, I don't know, Mike can help me out. Maybe I just didn't notice them, but I think 3D tabs were added in version 9 to the clip art library. Um, and they mystified me the first few times I was using them. So, you know, I didn't get a few things right, and um, I had a one project suffer because of it. <laughs> so I had to do a deep dive and figure out how to use those son of a guns. Of course, I was using V-Carve at the time. I didn't have a Spire yet. So, well, anyway. Okay, so I hope that answers that anyway. Let's see. Let's go back up here. We had some other questions. Um, go back down here. Uh, I all again wants to know, is there a reason or a way to carve such a dome in some sort of circular movement? Yes, sir, there is. And let me go back over here to uh, uh, Spire. Of course, it would help if you brought a Spire up first. Okay. Excuse me. <coughs> that... Uh, goes into your 3D finishing tool path. Let me bring up a straight Z here and I'll highlight that and let's uh, maximize the 3D view. You see with my uh, tool path turned on here, it's moving back and forth. It's carving in the raster direction using a raster strategy. If we go back into the tool path here, what you're talking about is doing an offset strategy. And an offset strategy is going to start in the center and work its way out in a spiral. The thing to watch out for when using an offset strategy, well, actually, there's two things to watch out for. Number one, on this model, it's not really that much of an issue because my thicker piece is here towards the center. But with a 3D finishing toolpath, if you have not done a 3D roughing toolpath first, what's going to happen is your bit's going to pick up from wherever you set your zero. It's going to go to the center and it's going to plunge all the way down to that, to that model and start machining. So if, if the Z depth here it needs to plunge down to is... Th five-eighths of an inch deep, it's going to plunge down five-eighths of an inch deep into that material and then start moving. That is rough on tools and it may or may not be rough on the machine. So that's one thing to watch out for. If you use an offset strategy, it doesn't care. It's going to go to the center of that uh, tool path, plunge all the way down to the depth and start cutting. If you're going to use an offset strategy, do a 3D roughing tool path first. I tend to leave a, uh, yeah, on a roughing, I tend to leave a machining allowance of about 30,000. Sometime I'll go less, sometimes I'll go more. That roughing tool path is going to hog away most of that material so that that little tapered ball nose only has about somewhere between 20 and 30 thousandths of an inch of material to remove. It's easier on the tool, it's easier on the machine. And even though it's a tapered ball nose, at the end of the day, in this case, this is still, well, this is a quarter inch ball nose, so it's not bad. 
I have some 16th of an inch and some 32nd of an inch tip diameter tapered ball nose joints, uh, bits rather. Even though it's got a quarter inch shank on it, at the end of the day, the tip of that bit is still only a 16th or a 32nd of an inch. And it'll break if you try to horse it too hard. So if you're using an offset strategy, do a roughing tool path first. The second thing to watch out for is every time the bit steps over, it's going to leave a little mark. And you may have seen it on some posts of projects that were put on like Facebook or Instagram or something like that. You can tell they have done a offset strategy because there will be a line running outside. That's a mark it makes when that machine steps over, when that tool steps over. Now, in V-Carve and Aspire, there is a way around that, but it adds machining time, and that is your step over retract. And what it'll do if I set it to, oh, let's say 20, uh, 0.02, 20 thousandths of an inch. When the bit makes a circuit around here, instead of just stepping out, it will actually lift out of the material, move over, then plunge back in and cut. So it eliminates those witness marks where the bit was stepping over. The problem is that's a, another rapid move. So it's more machine time because it's going to lift out of the material, plunge back in and cut. The more time it spends out of the material, the less efficient the tool path is. So it's a trade-off. Personally, I tend to use raster a lot more often. And when I'm actually cutting a project, I'll use a raster angle, usually of uh, 45 degrees. That way the bit is cutting across like so. It's not cutting with the grain. It's not cutting against the grain. It's kind of slicing it off a little of both. And I get a better finish that way. So, yes, you certainly can use the uh, um, offset strategy, and that will make it run in a spiral pattern. So, okay, let's see. Uh, Tony Cruz says, my question is about feeds and speeds. I've got a legacy 3x5 Maverick, and it chatters at times. I try adjusting feeds and speeds but it doesn't seem to make a difference. Any suggestions? Uh, chatter is usually caused, well, there's a, a few different um, causes of chatter. The first thing I would say is to make sure you have enough of the shank of that bit up in the collet, and it's nice and tight. Uh, depending upon the bit, some bits will have an, actually an indicator line with an arrow pointing to it, showing how much of that shank should be up in the collet. Uh, chatter is usually caused by too fast of a speed. But then again, I can get chatter. It just depends on the kind of material you're working with, especially in a hard maple. If the bit is running in one direction, it'll be just fine and nice and smooth. But if it gets to an end of a cut, steps over and comes back, I'll get chatter in that direction. Um, about all you can do is either slow it down or increase your RPM. But see how much bit shank is actually going up into the, uh, excuse me, up into the collet. Uh, another factor is depth of cut. As a general rule, I go about half of the bit's cutting diameter in my depth of cut. But even then, in some harder materials, I have to I have to make that a little more shallow because it just won't cut that hard material. Uh, purple hard or something like that. Very hard wood. And it doesn't like for me to cut it at an eighth of an inch per pass. I have to back it out to a sixteenth of an inch unless I really want to slow down my feed rate. And I just don't want to do that. So uh, it's kind of a balancing act. Um I would go over to Legacies. Um, they have excellent support. I would go over to their website and look for the support forum. 
And there's a little bit of um, misconception on support forums through these manufacturer websites. There may be one or two legacy employees that are members of the forum, but the overwhelming majority of the members of the support forums are users just like you and me. They have no affiliation with the company. They're just people who own the machine, use the machine, trade tips and tricks, and try to help people solve issues like this one. And this is a perfect example of a question I would go over to Legacy Support Forum and uh, post over there. Join and post over there. I mean, folks have figured out some real interesting and real effective methods of working around problems like that. But they know your machine best. I've never been in the same room with a, a Maverick. I like what I see, and I'm kind of jealous. But, um, you know, I would be guessing. So, hope that answers that question. Let's see. Let me go down here a little bit. Uh, Joshua Cummins wants to know, is there an email I can contact? you in regards to some questions new to vcarve there certainly is there's a link down in the description to my website mark lindsay cnc uh, when you get over there click the contact us page and send me a message there you can't attach a picture to that but i will reply to you and then you can attach pictures uh, to that email reply so that's marklindsaycnc.com, and then hit the contact us page. That's the best way for anybody to get uh, to get a hold of me. Uh, let's see. Lewis Denton wants to know: Will VCarve Desktop Nest? You know, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I believe it has a size limit of 25 by 25. I'm not certain if it nests or not. I've never used desktop. I started off with VCard Pro and then uh, upgraded to Aspire. So, I really don't know. Uh, you might head over to Vectrix website and look at the product comparison page. And that'll give you the breakdown. And I believe it says whether or not uh, desktop will nest or not. So, Sargon Tavor wants to know, is there a way to eliminate nodes if a vector imported from AutoCAD on the curve? Yes, there is. And I did a video on that. It's been a few years back. I need to redo it because I think I did that in VCAR version 8.0. Let's see. And it's called, if I'm not mistaken, reducing unwanted or eliminating unwanted or unnecessary nodes or points. I'll look it up and I'll put a link in the description of this video as soon as I'm finished here. Let's see. Just wrote a note. And uh, basically, there's a few ways of doing it. What I do is I just generally it depends on what it is. If it's a simple curve, I might just redraw it. Uh, if it's a fairly complex curve, I might use Bezier curves to fix it. And you'll know what I mean after that video. And I might use arcs, uh, circular arcs. It just depends. Whatever gives you the least number of nodes, usually the better off you are. Let's see. Um, Richard says, maybe not in subject. But have you ever tried image to lithophane in VCAR Pro to do 3D model? If yes, would you say it can replace Aspire? I'll answer your second question first, and that is nothing will replace Aspire. You can do you can push the limits of 3D in VCAR, but you will never have the the ability to not only um, create your own 3D models but also edit those 3D models, other than basic scaling, thickness, things like that. You don't have any of the smoothing tools. You don't have uh, any of the new shaping tools. Um, I've never tried image to lithophane. Um, and 
I know what you're getting at. The result of that, it it to me it never looked right. You when you're talking about um, image to lithophane, it 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 never really looked right to me. Uh, it it needed some work. It needed more relief that you're just not able to do with VCarve. So I hope that answered that question. Um, Mike Mazalik says 3D tabs are in version 8 may be included further back than that checking now well, that's okay I got uh, I first bought VCarve at version 8 so I never really uh, <laughs> I never really got into that uh, I was so new I did I was so new I didn't even know enough to know what I didn't know <laughs> so uh, Jim Hester says, I've been putting my bits three quarter inch into the collet. Should I be going further in? This is probably no surprise, but I made a video on that too. And I'll put a link in the description box to this video. And it is, let's see. I just made a note to add that to the description of this. Some bits have a little mark. It looks like a K the letter K. But if you look at it sideways, you can see that it's a line with an arrow pointing at it. That's the line. That's how deep you should be putting that uh, bit into the collet. Now, I can't say three quarters of an inch. I can't give you any definite number because every bit's a little bit different. I mean, I have... Oh, come on. This bit here, which is a thread milling bit, if I put this bit all the way in as deep as I think it needs to go, which would be down to about here, that doesn't give me a whole heck of a lot of threading capacity, uh, which is why I haven't used this bit yet. I think it was a waste of money, but that's just me. Um, I have other bits that I will, like my... Um, upcut and downcut spirals, I will bury those all the way into the collet until the top of the flutes are within about an eighth of an inch of touching the collet. I don't put any cutting edges up in the collet, but I'll put as much of that shaft in there as I can. Um, that's another thing that can lead to chatter, is just how much of that shank is in that collet. So I will put a... Uh, I'll put a link to that video in the description. So, let's see. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the uh, putting the link in there. I do appreciate it. Uh, okay, Kurt Briegel has a tip for you because he owns a Legacy Maverick. You lucky dog. That's a nice-looking machine, man. That really is a nice-looking machine. That's why I say I'm jealous. Okay, Mike Mazalik is 100% correct. Fit vectors to curves, and that's what I'm going to uh, link in the description. Um, Richard says, thank you. I will look to get a spire, I guess. Seems to do a lot. It really does, and I've only scratched the surface. I'm still learning to model, which is why I haven't done any more advanced modeling videos, because I'm still learning, and there's a lot to learn. And I'm my own worst critic, so I'll go through and I'll make a model, spend a couple hours on it, hate it, delete it, and start over. So at this rate, I'm going to have to just bite the bullet and accept the fact that I'm not going to get anything perfect. And um, I need to leave perfection to the artists and just show the process. Um, I don't know what kind of business you run, Richard, but I will say this. I know it's a large chunk of money it's it, it's a lot of money but even though i started with vcarve about six years ago and then upgraded to aspire well we're going on yeah going on a year and a half now i made that upgrade money back my fourth project with it so I firmly believe that this is not an expense, it's an investment. And if you start doing things in Aspire, 
that only Aspire can do and keep track, you'll find that you will not only make your money back quickly, you'll profit from it quickly as well. Because that's a service that a lot of folks can't provide. You know, uh, the ability to custom 3D model, I mean, just the models themselves have value. And they have good value. I mean, witness design and makes website. All of those models are made. <laughs> All those models are made in Aspire. So, you know, that's proof right there in and of itself. So, David Dietrich has an excellent point. Don't let perfect get in the way of the good. Absolutely true. Perfection is an abstract thought. What you consider perfect may not be perfect for me. And what I consider perfect may not be perfect for you. So I don't even try for perfection. I try for the absolute best job I can. And sometimes it's even acceptable to me. <laughs> but seriously, I am my own harsh critic. Uh, do Okay, Lewis Denton wants to know, do updates to Vectric software come free? Yes and no. And I say that because what they have done in the past. Now, please know, I don't work for Vetric, And I don't know anything more than anybody else does. What they have done in the past is, within the version, they'll have an upgrade. For instance, here most recently, it was they upgraded from version 10 to 10.5. That upgrade to 10.5 from version 10 was free to everybody who had version 10. If you're still using 9.5, it was not a free upgrade. But if you had version 10, the upgrade to 10.5 was free. Now, if you buy right now, I won't say right now, but if you buy at the current version, 10.5, and they release version 11 within 12 months, you'll get a free upgrade to version 11. If it's 13 months, that upgrade has a fee. And the fee is different based on which software title you have. When I bought version 8.0, uh, 8 I got a free upgrade to version 8.5. And I used it for quite a while. Then version 9 came out. And I had to pay for that upgrade because it was well after the 12-month period. But I never looked back. It's, it's always been worth it. It has always been worth the upgrades because the number of things they add to these upgrades is just mind-boggling. I mean, they added complete tool paths. You know, the uh, threading tool path, the... Uh, uh, thread. Let's see, the thread milling tool path, and what else did they add here? Um, chamfer tool paths. Uh, a couple of versions ago, they added the uh, photo V-carve tool paths. I mean, they're adding new features all the time. Rotary axis support. I mean, it's always been worth it to me to get the newest version of the software. And again, I don't think of it as an expense. I think of it as an investment because I know I'm going to get that money back, usually within the first few jobs. And if I can't, I really need to re rethink my business strategy because I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> so, Okay, uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and call this good. Oh my goodness, it's already been 42 minutes. If there are no other questions... Um, I don't think there were, so we'll go ahead and we'll call this good. I'm not really sure. Well, I, I kind of am, but I'm kind of not sure what I'm going to do for next week. Today we had, I, I've had three or four questions about, um, step overs for 3D carving and how to reduce machining time using the step over. So I may do a short video on that. I may combine it into a your Vectrix questions answered. Um, but I, I had that and another subject come up. So I may do a, a, 
answer two questions in the next video. I'm not sure. It just depends on what goes on behind the scenes here. I've got a lot of things going on. So um, I will say thank you very much for uh, joining me this Sunday. Excuse me. Boy, it's been a heck of a week. And um, I guess I'll see you again next week. Again, I'm not really sure what the video is going to be, but we'll figure that out when we get there. So thank you very much for spending part of your Sunday with me. Y'all have a real good day, a good week. Stay safe out there. Now, go out and do something cool. Bye, y'all. Take care.